Today we have a, an exciting a speaker with us. Um, we're very looking, much looking forward to hearing what he has to share. But before that, I was like to have a student to be the official introduction speaker, but I get to introduce the student and write about you know you guys, what wonderful students we have. So our introducer today is Lindsay Brown, who is a senior studying digital marketing in the Meyer and Communications. She's involved in sorority on campus, serves as a tour guide, and interestingly enough, she's a third generation UNG student. Her grandparents, her father, and her aunt all went to you, and she loved that. Uh, she's passionate about marketing and had wonderful experiences through her internship with Liza Partners, uh, which we'll probably talk about a little bit if she does the introduction. She created content for their social media platforms and learned a lot about digital marketing. And so she's especially excited to be here to do this introduction today. Lindsay, thank you for doing this. And um, take just one minute to tell them how you got your internship, unless Eric's going to do that. Okay, yeah, we'll take one minute just to talk about that too. Yeah, brought up it and then introduce it. Okay, thank you. All right, hello everybody. Um, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, so I kind of do have, I guess, a funny story about how I did during this internship. Um, I found out at one of our last kind of business meetings, I'm pretty known as Gutsy Lindsay, according to the National College of Business. Um, I guess that rings pretty true. Um, basically, why I got this was about a year ago. I was looking for internships in the digital marketing sphere, um, and I actually kind of looked on UNG, like the Microsoft College of Business LinkedIn page, looked at all of the alumni, and Eric's name popped up. Um, so I kind of saw that he does have his own firm, he's a partner there. Um, so I actually sent him a nice little message on LinkedIn, being like, hey, my name's Lindsay. I noticed that we both go to UNG, went to UNG, um, and have that shared love. So if you're willing, you know, I kind of applied for his internship and kind of pushed my name along. Um, he told me that he pushed my name in front of a line. Um, so I guess that makes me a little bit gutsy, um, but I actually did really enjoy this internship and definitely kind of solidified my passion and my love for digital marketing. I hope to pursue a career in the future uh, with the firm by my year. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce Mr. Holtzclaw. Um, so Eric B. Holtzclaw is a visionary idea guy and serial entrepreneur with over 25 years of experience, whose tech background and experience founding and scaling businesses led him to be a sought-after expert to Fortune 500 Global 2000 and mid sized companies for applying the best technology and techniques to support overall marketing goals. Today, Eric is a co founding partner and chief strategist for the full service marketing firm, Liger Partners, combining his three loves business, technology, and people. Mr. Holtzclaw has contributed to magazines and online publications and wrote the book Flattery Unlocking the Potential of Consumer Behavior. He's also a host of the Claw Podcast, where he interviews business owners and entrepreneurs, allowing them to share their insights and marketing expertise. Out of all the ideas he's brought to life, Eric says his daughter is his greatest one. Now I guess I'll open the floor to you, Mr. Holtzclaw. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon and everyone who's at the remote. So make sure, if you can't hear me for some reason, let me know, and I really will be tempted to walk around. So <laughs> So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. So the way that I talked about this is lessons learned along an entrepreneurial journey. So typically when you hear from people, they potentially gone to work for some large company and built their career that way. And I started in that direction, but didn't stay there long. So I have kind of on a non-traditional path. In fact, uh, when I was five years old, I wanted to work for IBM, or I wanted to be president of the United States. <laughs> Those were my two choices. Uh, and one of the reasons I really liked IBM is in Atlanta, IBM was the company to work with. Now, it may not be so cool nowadays, but there wasn't, you know, Home Depot was really just in its beginning. IG wasn't there. If you did it at IBM, you had made it. And I programmed computers probably from the age of seven or eight. 
Um, this was before you could go buy them <laughs> in the store. You would buy a magazine, you would have the code in the back, and then you would code the computer and then play the game. So you were way, way invested into you know, making sure that, that, that you played that game and played it for a long time. So these were sort of my things. I might still end up being president of the United States, but my wife could have enjoyed that because politics are not our favorite thing. Uh, so my path to working at IBM, because I did end up there, started in a furniture store. So my grandfather worked for a furniture store in Canton, Georgia, called Cherokee Furniture. And he's the guy who would go out and fix everybody's washers and dryers when they were broken. And I went to visit him one day, and one of the guys that he worked with, his son, came to Georgia College. And so I met him at the furniture store, and he's like, yeah, I go to Georgia College. It's a military college, so when I attended, if you were on campus and then you were at Yale, you were in the military. So I really like it, but the thing I like the most is I'm in a co-op program. And I co-op with IBM. I was like, ah, oh, that's amazing. That's where I want to end up. And so I just kind of started putting my sights on the world as a potential place to go and work and or start coming to school and uh, look at how they might like that might work from a program perspective. The other thing that happened for me is RISA had a summer honors program that they just started in the time that I was in high school. And I spent a summer here on campus between my junior and senior year, going to the arts department, participating in a lot of things on campus. It was a really fun kind of activity. And it was a way for me to experience the school and really think, you know, would I like it, those nice things. My daughter, that Lindsay mentioned earlier, did similar things at her choice of college, and it was very helpful in deciding where she ended up and what she wanted to do. So I decided that I would apply it to an Georgia College, and I did end up here. Here are my pictures from Frog Week. Uh, right here now. You know you're there. So you get employees, your head off. Um, uh, so that's the us graduating. You know, back then I don't know if they still do this, but they used to tell you at the end of the week that you're going to have to jump out of an helicopter and you didn't get all of the things right for the right legs. It's a very scary kind of you know, stuff, but it was fun. It was one of those ways to kind of get us into the homes, the fraternity of the military college. And of course, wearing the white T-shirt, which I wouldn't wear one today when I was dressing. I was like, I have to wear something that's not my T-shirt. That means you're a freshman. No. Have to like say things to the seniors and those sorts of things. And uh, my wife is with me today, went to the sweetheart ball here on campus. So we've been together for a very long time. She's been through all these uh, experiences with me as I follow this kind of crazy career path and does currently work for my company. So if you want another presentation sometime about how to both work with your spouse and stay with your spouse, you can give me some really good tips. So through all of this, I did participant work with the uh, on-campus organization for doing the co-op program, and I ended up at IBM my freshman year at North Georgia College, third quarter. So there used to be our quarter program, and you guys have taken about semesters now, and so I was here for two, and then I went and started co-oping at IBM, and I probably looked like I was five when I walked onto that campus. But went from the blue suit to the gray suit to the ties. And it was amazing. We had they had us sitting on customer support lines, supporting um, classrooms with a system that they had built that allowed the schools to teach their kids how to use computers and you know, learning that type of thing. And that's how I really got indoctrinated to my yeah. So the sad part is, oh, and by the way, I come here for a computer science degree, so I was programming computers, and I also learned in my computer science classes. I probably didn't want to program computers the rest of my life. Now, I've never programmed a computer, but I know how to talk to technologists, and I know when they're telling me things that aren't true, and so it does give me a really nice background in what I do today. So you may get a degree that you don't use you know, specifically that way, but it will be your ground to do other things. And so at the time I was at IBM, IBM was laying off a lot of people. So they were in the middle of a bunch of layoffs, and they didn't know how to do it. So this was before companies really did big layoffs, and they were giving these people way too much money. So they're typically in their 40s and 50s, they're giving them these large pensions to take a package and go off and do something else or just leave. And these people were too young to retire, so they weren't going to stop working, 
But what they did in Atlanta is they went and started a bunch of startups. And so I went to work for a company. Oh, actually, that was my joke. My parents cried when I left IBM. Okay, so I left IBM and my parents cried. They're like, who leaves IBM? But my dad worked for Delta for years. My mom worked in big companies. They thought when I got the IBM deal that it was like, that is the, you're going to get the gold watch, you're going to be the rest of your life, you have it made. And when I had the idea, I realized, I'm not going to like it so much. It's kind of boring, a little too structured. Uh, when my wife married me, she's like, hey, I married this IBM guy. He goes in at seven, he wins at four, this is amazing. And then I naturally agreed once some dreams and got a job with a company called Geomedica back in the day. And Geomatic had been started by a bunch of these ex owners So they had this pension running. The company was only 40 people. 30 of those people were ex owners And because I walked in with an IBM background, I was almost immediately in. It was kind of a fraternity in the class. And you could say, oh, I worked at IBM. You said, which buildings were you in? What did, what did you do? And there I met a really crazy CEO. So I met a guy who I uh, started history accounting software, which is probably one that you guys are most familiar with. Uh, he'd also done several other startups. And his name's John Hayes. And what I, what he, uh, a lot of people were really scared of John. And either because of my military experience here in North Georgia <laughs> or other reasons, he didn't scare me. I was like, he's just a guy. He, had, you know, he gets upset sometimes, but he's somebody who's just looking for somebody to help support him. So he and I ended up creating a really good relationship. And when they ultimately sold Geomatica and he went to start some other companies, he was allowed to take one employee with him and he took one with him. And so from there, I never ended up in a large company again. In fact, my history is about 30 different companies. So I have a very varied background in lots of different industries and spaces. And not all of these appear are successes. This is an example of things that worked things that didn't. Some of the key that did work well, one coast, we were the largest PC placement in the 90s. We applied to uh, manufacturing rep agencies, which are the people who sell, get the home decorative accessories. We applied technology on the back end to make them more efficient. Uh, so it was, Atlanta was not a place for PC money. It was not a place for entrepreneurship. Being out to her was not what it is today. It's kind of, oh, you decided you don't want to work. You don't really want to have a job, those types of things. Uh, but that was kind of interesting. User Insight is a business that I sold in 2012 and swore I'd never start another one. <laughs> they made a couple promises, and then we accidentally started Liber Partners <laughs> over the course of the last couple of years. And if you're if you haven't caught on, Liber Partners is named after the movie Napoleon Dynamite. So I had a strategy firm, and I was signing a lot of clients on the marketing side, and my long-term assistant said, you realize this isn't a consultancy anymore, you really have a company, but in order for it to be effective, we needed to acquire an uh, execution company on the back end. So we merged the two businesses, and we wanted to come up with a name that meant the merge of two things, and they were strong, so a lion and a tiger. And we love the movie, The Company Dynamite. Now you have to watch it twice. So if you only watched it once, that's why you don't like it. Watch it the second time. And so the company is very much steeped into the movie the point nine. We have a disco ball in our in the middle of our space. You know, one of our key uh, core values is that we're hungry for tots. We are not on those or summer weekly, which are bullies. So that means that we're nice. So we really do play into that and use that. I mean it's a marketing company, you gotta do something fun, right? And so in this course of all of these companies and things that I did. One of the things that's interesting about it is I may not have worked for any Fortune 500 or Global 2000 companies, but I have worked with a lot of them. So when we were at User Insight, we, we supported Fortune 500 Global 2000 doing user research, and we would do somewhere around 250 to 300 projects a year. So you don't have to go to work for the big company to get the big company experience understand how they work, what they do, and they often bring me in or others like me in to give them that outside of perspective, to look at things in a way that they don't, they're slow, they don't necessarily just keep up with the trends, because if you think about it, they're working within the big company, and if you're working with a lot of big companies, you can kind of bring key insights back to them. So 
I, I and I've gotten into just a lot of like fun and interesting experiences based on this. So there are other paths, and I would suggest to you in today's economy and market, you need to figure out what it is that you do well and promote and sell that to a company. The other choice is that you're hired by a company and the company sells what you do well to other people. So think of yourself as your own sort of um, skill set, your own kind of company along the way. So what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about the lessons that I say so far. Because <laughs> I learned new lessons about being an entrepreneur all the time. And so one thing I'm going to tell you is that being an entrepreneur is not an easy job. It is not all the things that you see, Steve Jobs, and Elon Musk, and Marcus Lemonis, which is my favorite entrepreneur, if you don't know who he is, he's the prophet on CNBC, he's one of the more grounded, I think. They are the rock stars of this world, and we see a lot about this kind of entrepreneurship being a rock star thing. It is a tough, tough job. It's just as tough as deciding that you're going to go into famous singing, or acting, or any of those kinds of things. So you shouldn't tread into it lightly. It is not an alternative to having done the traditional job thing because you just don't like traditional jobs. You are going to work harder as an entrepreneur than you will if you go work for a company. In fact, I often envy those that are comfortable enough to just go to work every day, take the vacation, do those types of things. I'm constantly dealing with types of situations that you typically wouldn't in that case. So don't just see it as this sort of it's been an interesting trend because when I did it, I was sort of in this weird place, and now being an entrepreneur is like this really cool rock star thing. And you just have to be careful that you don't get caught too much of into that mythology. Okay? So, my lesson so far is to always say yes. And now, there's a lot of people out there who are like, oh, no, no, you should say no because you need to limit your time, you need to whatever. I am a yes man. Probably too much to my, uh, my teens. You know, they come to me with a problem, and I'm like, yeah, but I don't know how we can do it. Like, don't tell me how we can. I don't know how we can. I have to live in this world of possibility. And as an entrepreneur, you truly do. You have to think every day, this is possible. I can get there. This is going to you know, really be something that's going to work. And make sure that you're navigating moving forward. It also means that you don't live in the past much. It's not that you don't take lessons from the past, but you can't look back on those failures and dwell there. You have to really be future thinking and thinking about what you can do. And my willingness to say yes has been part of what's happening in a lot of these opportunities. So this is just kind of a sampling. Like I've been interviewed by CNN. I've been quoted in USA Today. I wrote for Inc. Magazine for a couple of years because I sat at a table with Eric Schoenberg, who is the editor of Inc. Uh, in New Orleans. And he asked me if I'd like to start writing a column. And I, I wasn't a writer at that point. And I was like, sure, sounds great. Once a week? Perfect. I can do that. 500 words. And then I think I called in April with two people in the office. And so I can do 500 words every week for the new magazine. So I kind of figured that out. I was on the radio for a couple of years uh, interviewing entrepreneurs about their entrepreneurial journey because I've always been obsessed as to what makes entrepreneurs work or not. Uh, people often think it's like money and access and resources. It's often about your background. So what, what's in your past is really what drives you. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to go to Saudi Arabia. I've also gone to uh, all over the world riding tractors. So we did this big study on tractors. I got to ride tractors everywhere. So that's a tractor I guided a partner over in uh, East Germany. So we're on this farm kind of riding around and figuring out how tractors work. Because we said yes to a company that we could redesign the interfaces on the inside of our tractor. And we did a good job. So thinking of saying yes figuring out then how to accomplish it. And to be an entrepreneur, you say yes, because that person has money, and you figure out how to then deliver the service on the back end. And that is a type of walk that many people can't make. They're like, I don't know how to do this, how can I tell this person that I can? If it's within your sort of spectrum and understanding, you can put those resources behind it. It's very important in the entrepreneurial world, specifically if you're trying to stand something out, that you say yes. The next one is never give up. And so I take this one actually from my wife, because this is what she often says about me as the number one, my number one trait, is that I just never give up. <laughs> I've 
you know, every day I do the thing, no matter what's going to break them down or not work. Now, when I talk about never giving up, I'm not telling you to be foolhardy. So I'll see people who start a company and it's not a good idea, you know, they're putting all of their money into it, they haven't really built all the right types of things around them. You do have to put them, you do have to know what the right sort of circumstances that you're getting into, but, but you can't give up. And when you are the entrepreneur and running the business, everyone is looking to you and your leadership. And if you are not in it and you feel like you can't make it, they will be that. So being in that leadership position, it's very important that you believe within your heart that it is going to happen. And you can get your car on fire <laughs> or screaming out in the shower or whatever, but you have to make sure that everyone knows that you can never give up. And specifically as we've gone through this last phase, um, I kiddingly say that we weren't going to start another business. So we raised our daughter, she's off in Kalamazoo, Michigan. You know, I was going to be her consultant the rest of my career, and then we got into this company, and we started it and really started earnestly thinking about it right before everything happened with the pandemic. So we just basically got it established. And I, I truly believe providentially that the experiences we had in our past is the reason we've been able to keep the company alive through the pandemic. We lost half our revenue in March. We kept every employee the entire time, okay, all the way through. People kept calling me and asking me, when's it going to be over? And I'm like, well, we have to start seeing some good news. Like, that's the first thing. We can't make any change so we can feel more confident. And my only intent with the company was to be standing on the other side. That was it. I wasn't trying to grow it. We took some really weird deals and did some really strange projects for clients, but it was just to keep the doors open. So not never give up. If you really believe in it, if you really think it's your thing, you just got to stay with it. Because once you do, it's over. Absolutely. I also think this might have been talked to me in North Georgia because I'm like the party. And I was like, you can do one more push up. And I'm like, no, I can't. Yeah, you can. I'm like, okay, and I don't need one more push up. And then the next is around breaking down your barriers. So when I talk about breaking down your barriers, you have to see what's holding you back. I'm amazed at the number of entrepreneurs that I run into, and I, I call this sort of the shark tank. Um, uh, thing like Shark Tank is not an example of how investors work. Investors do not want to invest in your business. They do not want to give you their hard-earned money. And when you see our Shark Tank, it's sort of almost a game, it's a competition, you know, they're playing to the TV. When you go to a true investor pitch, that investor is telling themselves the entire time, how and why can I say no to this deal? Not how and why can I say yes, or argue with someone else to get into that. So when you think about money, one of the first things that I first think about is like, oh, I gotta go raise the money to get someone to support my idea. No. You have to figure out how you can sell something to someone, use that money, and move yourself up into the next level, or establish that there is really a market opportunity. One of the uh, secrets around like Kickstarter and some of these things is that's a way that an investor is determining whether or not your idea is a good idea. So if you can do a Kickstarter campaign and you get money, then they may invest because it shows that there's a market need. So don't go ask someone else for money to start your idea. Figure out how you can start your idea on your own, and then the investor is more interested because you take it to a certain level, and you don't give up as much ownership. So thinking about what those barriers are there in your way, What's that little voice that's telling you that you can't do it, that it's not going to work? You have to kind of get out of your way. The number one that I, I see is kind of people will tell me, well, I haven't started yet because I don't have the money. And then you just cannot use that as an excuse. That is not a proper And then perfecting your process. So when you're, not, when you're running a business, what you need to do is make sure that you are not the reason that it exists. So if you have a business, and the only reason that a business exists is because you know how to do a thing, you don't have a business. You basically created a job. And I see a lot of people who created what I consider really, really uh, difficult jobs. They could be making more money working for someone else. They could be you know, not dealing with all the headache of having overhead. So you really do need to perfect your process. I, at the end of the day, am an operations guy. I love operational structure. I like to touch things once and never again. I have this rule of three. So if you're going to do something, 
more than three times, it involves more than three people, or it has more than three steps, it should be written down as a process, and we should perfect that process. It's only in thinking about how the business runs and making it repeatable that you will be able to be successful. The research company that we had, we did those 250 to 300 projects a year because we had a very prescribed way that we took on those research projects. So we would have a Fortune 500 call us, they would have launched a website or a new thing and it wasn't working, they missed a new research project. We could have it in the field in five days. So the ability to turn it quickly and, and we could charge more for it. So There's the rush order, right? I distinctly remember a large news agency here in Atlanta calling us and saying, we need to be in the lab next week and we need to run 40 people. Can you do it? And I'm like, yeah, this is what it costs. He's like, oh, we're meeting lab next week, right? He's like, yeah, this is going to cost. And so we were able to pull that off because we could perfect more process. So always thinking about how you can touch something once, really turn it into something repeatable, because that's how you're creating business. And leaning heavily into creating something that has some recurring revenue. So I love people who have ideas around you know, products, you know, so if you're creating handles or you like these other types of things, that's not often recurring revenue. So it's a very hard path to go when you have to find a micro distribution. So how do you get someone to pay you for something over time, over and over again? This is why you see them, so many software products that move from buying a software product to a file-based model because they've been having like recurring and repeat revenue that then allows you to, to move the business forward. So go back to your process. And then you have to be about control. And this was a lesson that was sort of hard for me. I'm a little bit of a control work. So I'm good about the perfection of your process, but I understood how the process worked. I could run it better than anyone else. Uh, I went to spring break and I read a book called Myth which is uh, by Michael Gerber. So it's one of the kind of early business books. So if you're looking for something to read that really tells you what a business is to look like and how it works, it's one of the foundational books in my opinion. I did the classic thing. So I went and read this book and I came back from spring break and I told my team, we're changing everything. I read this book, which is the serious thing your boss can tell you, right? But he does talk about turning your business into a franchise and making it work in a way that, it, that you don't have to be there. And this is that, like, well, what if you got hit by a bus or diagnosed with something, you know, those types of things. But you know, you, you might want to take a vacation. And you might want to take a vacation and your phone not ring the entire time or have to check it. And the only way you can do that is starting to give up control. Understanding that you have people in place and that those people will need to be able to, to do the job for you. I had a project manager who worked with me before my great awakening, and uh, we were running these studies. and. I was being a little bit of a control freak, and I kept showing up to the study, and I was basically running the study. And she came to me and she said, so we have this big study happening, it was with Southern Company at the time, and uh, if you come to the study, I quit. And I was like, why? Oh, okay. So why? She's like, well, because you don't need me. Like, if you're going to show up and run the study, why did you hire me? I'm like, okay, got it. I will stay at the office next to a phone and you can call me if anything goes wrong. So the first day ran great. Second day, we had an ice storm. And we were working with Southern Company. <laughs> they have to roll trucks and get people out there, so it really impacted that second day. But much to my PM you know, who was working for me, um, I, I guess honor or whatever. So she did a great job. Like she kept calling me and like, this just happened. I'm like, okay, do this. Okay, do this. So I was gonna helping from behind, but she was brave enough to stand up and say and give me that lesson. So you kind of have to look through those lessons along the way. And it's in the getting up with under control that you're going to have opportunities both to do something more with your business and also to potentially, potentially step out of it in some way. Uh, we follow in our company a process called EOS, which is the Entrepreneurial Operating System. It's based on a book by Gino Whitman called Traction. And it has a visionary and an integrator, and then you have your kind of key people running the business. I sit in the visionary seat because I'm the guy who comes up with all the crazy ideas and wants to change everything. And I have a very strong integrator who is my balance. And so she's also the managing partner of the firm. So when I come up with a great idea, she's the one who's going to tell me why I should think about it differently. She'll not tell me no, but she might tell me how to think about it differently or what the impact would look like. And that keeps us from running off the brands, which is something that you'll see 
not for ventures, they're just changing course too often. You have to leave something in place for a period of time to make sure it's really working and that it's functioning before you make changes to it. And then finally, you need to identify the exits. Businesses are not meant for the long run. No one wants to die at their desk. So when you start a business, there will be an exit. You will either sell the business, you will decide to close the business, you will merge the business with someone else, you will give it to someone else, but you will have a last day in that business. It's not like getting married, which is supposed to last your entire lifetime, or some of these other kind of uh, things that we talk about. This is something that is supposed to eventually go away. So identifying that exit and understanding where you're going and what you're doing is very important because it's going to depend on what type of business you build because of different types of businesses, lifestyle businesses, you know, people who set up insurance workers, that's a different lifestyle business. It's a pretty good lifestyle business. First three or four years are terrible, and then you kind of live off what you create and you know move forward. Most of the businesses I've done are not so easy because they're often people. I'm selling people and paper and frames. And that means you gotta hire people, and you gotta manage people, and make sure that they know how to do what you need them to do. Uh, and then you have other businesses that are really meant to be sold. They're mergers and acquisitions, and that's a lot of the activity you're seeing today, which is to increase value and eventually take a business model or to kind of move it into that place. When you're identifying the exits, you need to make sure that anyone that you go in partnership with or that you're working with is also aligned. I'm very big on partnering with someone to run a business. I don't believe that one person can do it effectively. You have to have someone who's more focused on the outside and the inside, someone who's out doing sales, you know, promoting the business, those types of things. And then someone who's very interested in kind of keeping the staff going and the lights on. Those are typically two different types. And really, the best businesses are in threes. So you have an inside person, an outside person, and you have a subject matter expert. Somebody who knows how to do something really well, but they don't know how to run the themselves. So if you look at those kind of things, then I'm suggesting maybe a business with a partnership of you know one to two different people. Now, I've been in some business situations in the past where I was not the majority owner because of my partnership, and that will never happen to me again. I'm not telling you not to do it, but I typically advise that it's your business. You should always make sure that you own 51 percent you're fully in control. If you do split it up and you decide that you're going to work with someone and you're like, oh, at the beginning, you know, starting a business, everything is, is, is rosy. And you know? it's like, oh, we're going to do it 50 50. It'll be great. Building a partnership is not about the beginning, it's about the end. What's going to happen at the end? And you need one person who can make the vote. You also need to know that you're designating the exit that you both want. And so my example of that is that I might say to you that we are going to go ski. Now some of you thought of water skiing, and some of you thought of snow skiing. If we're not very clear on what that is, then we're going to show up in the car or at the airport with completely different types of equipment. One's going to have a swimsuit, the other's going to have, you know, skis. Uh, or, I didn't know. I didn't snow ski before. I no idea. How do you water ski? So this has been a very important thing. So when you're sitting there at the beginning to put the business together, make sure that you know what you want at the end. What does that look like for you at the end? That's kind of a grim way of looking at it, but it's very important to structure it and everyone kind of gets all happy about the idea and pitching it, thinking about you know where the source customers are going to come from. But this is where it becomes really important. So along my way from North Georgia, and I get North Georgia a great grounding for what I did. It was the place that you know, got me into what I thought was my dream place of IBM, but also gave me the uh, opportunity to sort of spread my wings and think about what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. And that's really how you should see your college education. Hopefully people have learned that lesson. You know, it, it is about getting a degree, but it's about the connections you make and the things you do with that college sort of experience. It's one of the few times that you're as free as you will ever be to experiment and to take some risks. Uh, the opportunities of doing internships and other things like that are incredibly important to learning where you might want to be. And it's really okay to make a mistake. Like, if you get out and you hate the degree you got and whatever, do something else, 
and most people have three or four careers. I'm on my third career. I started my own recovering technologies. I ran the knowledge shops for a period of time, a research firm, and now I'm a marketing firm. So those are, it sounds like three completely different types of degrees and backgrounds that we all feed off of each other really well. Because you think about today's marketing, it's mostly digital. So it's a combination of technology, understanding your user, and using technology to get to it. So you've got a great kind of period of time you're in right now to, to learn what you want to do, and you probably don't know what that is. I always tell people, when I grow up, <laughs> oh, well, you know, I have to update my, it's not 25 years anymore, it's more than that. So anyway, so I appreciate you guys' time. I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn. You can find me on, as Lindsay told you, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Do Respond. Uh, and you can also go to uh, LightRefractors.com. So if you have any questions, want to ask anything, um, you know, I've been there, done that sort of a street smart entrepreneur. Uh, and it's it's just knowing that it's not what you see on TV. So I will take any questions that you guys have around entrepreneurship or otherwise. Yes? Um, so, you know, your whole talk was on lessons learned. Was there anything specific to the pandemic that you learned going through that? that I would say never give up was probably the number one, right? Um, and I am probably more patient than most entrepreneurs probably, so I can let some of them work this way out. Uh, that, say yes, I have a long term system to work with me forever. And I will say yes to things on my calendar, and she's like, that's a conflict. Yeah, that something to change, and it normally does. So the conflict, the conflict on the other is going to always go away. So with the pandemic, you know, I, I went through the dot bomb, we went through the 9/11, we went through the 2007, 2008 thing. So it was a combination of all of that. And if you weren't in the right, like we lost interest in our revenue because we were working with some travel companies and we were working with some uh, other companies. In fact, we were working with American Express on business travel, and we lost 95 percent of our revenue in March. Time. So that's not survival. That's very difficult to survive on. So diversifying what you're doing, what that looks like does help. And the recurring revenue was also sort of a nice savior for us. But the pandemic is not, it's not with many problems. So, and the government did a good job of setting in and assisting in those categories and not making it terribly difficult to uh, have small businesses, uh, which is not the case in some of the previous types of cases. How many have you You have to do that. <laughs> no, honestly, they never give up. Just keep trying every day. Keep doing it. Another idea. Yeah. You haven't failed until you stop. I mean, it's the truth. You just haven't failed until you stop. And, and I'm not suggesting that you be fool market, right? There are business models that are wrong. Like, if you talk to somebody and they tell you, I don't think that's going to work, it's best to really start using that in space, you should listen to them. Like, when I started the research company, a lot of people in the research space said that what I was suggesting was not possible. Because I thought we could build a beautiful research model, so we could do things. And all the research companies offered things like, no, 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 everything's custom, there's no way to do that. And so we did, but we knew it worked because we tried it for six to 12 months. So you have to try something for about a six to 12 month window. And if it's not working that six to 12 months, then you probably have a problem. Typically, it takes a company three years to really get into its own, and those people will stop in like 18 to 19 months. And that 18 month is good. If it's going to take more than 18, then you may not have a formal business. I know we have another marketing students here, so your other hat. Um, what advice would you give students who are interested in going into their marketing? What do they give you thinking about when they're going to start? So, um, Marketing, so that's my that's another presentation I did, which is called Making Sense of the Modern Day Marketing Things. And the biggest thing that you need to understand about marketing is that it's not what it was prior to 2008. It's, it's very technology based. And it's because in 2008 we had three disruptive technologies. So people blame it on the financial markets. They're like, oh, the finance markets changed, and blah, blah, blah. We got smartphones in 2008, we got ubiquitous internet, and we got social media. 
and those three technologies were terribly disrupted. The pandemic was disrupted. You know, people changed the way that they purchased things and did things. So as a marketer, really understanding your user, which is what my book is about. It's my book is about customer research and really get down to percent of this. And they need to know technology. If you're going into marketing and think it's just like I talk about, I tell people, and you may not, I can use references, but I forgot to tell my notes what they are. So I know who Mr. Rogers was in my company. Like they're giving a presentation, and you only know that Mr. Rogers, but they're like, yeah. This old guy who's Eric's teacher. I'm like, that's not my teacher. It's Mr. Rogers. Anyway, Don Draper from Made, you know, Madden. Everybody thinks marketing is that. It is not. It's more like breaking back. <laughs> it's like making the best bet and making it over and over again. So being consistent, staying in front of your customers. It used to take seven to ten times for a customer to be aware of your brand. It is now 21. Three times the number. We have the attention span less than a goldfish. Goldfish attention spans are eight seconds. That's like eight seconds. Human beings are seven. So you gotta have something that stands out, it has to be visceral. And then once they react to it, you have to have someone to take them. There has to be something behind that. And today, all of that is built on technology platforms. All of it. Even if it starts offline, you have to have a way to support it online. So as a marketing person, the more you understand the technology and how it connects, the smarter you are about putting those things together and figuring out how to, how to supply it from the market. So I take a couple of technology classes. A little like basic programming. <laughs> yes? Do you have any predictions for what a future disruption might be in terms of technology for marketing? Uh, I don't know. The pandemic was a huge one, right? Like we went from this uh, Instacarts, you know, people like I used Instacart occasionally, but the pandemic came and I'm like, why would I go to the grocery store? You know, so now there's not, there's little ways of getting in front of people. So this whole sort of concept of you know, stores becoming showrooms is is here. Uh, that impacts the way that we think about technology. Meta is new, like we'll see what that means. This virtual reality thing, we've been talking about it forever. In fact, I took a class here on artificial intelligence back when I was here and flew out to Austin for my uh, project and met an artificial intelligence company then. And so we still think about those things, but you know, connected devices, convenience, all that stuff has been very instructive. We're working with another customer who relies very heavily on like wires and that's not happening anymore because we're getting things like 5G, so you've got wireless everywhere. So it's just really access, it's probably the biggest thing. Um, you know, cash, you know, that, how, that, how often do you use cash any longer? What does that look like? How quickly do you pay for things in a transactional way? So, FinTech's an interesting space. The pandemic is a was one of the sign of like three disruptive periods all in one. Because we were forced to do things that we wouldn't have. Right. On the round, if anybody has any questions, I appreciate you guys' time. All right. joining us today and we should be announcing our next federal speaker before too very long for, to work on the schedule for that. But thank you for coming to Eric. Thank you so much. Wonderful words of wisdom and thank you for sharing your story and your journey. I really appreciate it. Well, round of